Hi, it's Dr. Lori, and this is Lies and Myths. These are the lies, you know, basic myths, truths, and the myths, those things that have just been long-standing, long, widely held information that actually are wrong in the antiques community. So I want you to learn about these. I've been doing this for a long, long time, 25 years or so in the field, and I want you to get this information and get it right. So here are some of the things that I want you to think about. So. So if you've heard some of these and you're questioning them, I want you to put them in the comments. I want to hear what you've heard so we can straighten all of this out. So our first, of course, lie or myth is paintings must be signed to be valuable. Okay, I have been saying this for a long, long time and it's very simple. The Mona Lisa, for example. You think the Mona Lisa isn't valuable? Well, the Mona Lisa isn't signed. So everyone goes, has to be signed to be valuable, has to be signed to be valuable. The Mona Lisa is a perfect example of a piece that is unsigned yet very valuable. About $900 million is the insurance value on the Mona Lisa at the Louvre in, of course, Paris, France by Leonardo da Vinci. That's a perfect example of this particular myth that paintings must be signed to be valuable. In fact, in the history of art, many paintings were not signed purposefully because for example, John Singleton Copley, the great colonial American artist, he didn't sign some of his great portraits. And one of the reasons was it was seen as marketing, which was inappropriate then, right, to actually sign your name. You got paid to paint the painting. That's what they thought. You're not going to actually market yourself too by signing your name. That was something that we saw, of course, back in the colonial period. So again, this is a big myth that paintings have to be signed to be valuable. Many of these paintings, in fact, are unsigned and they're ultra valuable. I've appraised a lot of them too. So, you know, even in my appraisals of Leonardo da Vinci paintings, which I've done, you know, these pieces are not signed and they're very valuable. So don't believe that myth. This next myth is one that lots of you glass lovers talk about, and it has to do with Vaseline glass. Only Vaseline glass fluoresces under black light. People believe that only Vaseline glass will fluoresce or light up under black light. Now, that's not true. That's a myth as well. So a couple of things about this. It's called actually uranium oxide glass, or glass that will actually emit this yellow green kind of limey color when it actually is put under black light. So remember, people will say it's only that kind of glass, but in fact there are other glasses that contain this particular type of element and that particular element is what makes it light up under black light. You know, when you're looking for pieces like this, you want to think about all of these characteristics. That's why it's a good idea for you to have all the tools in your, in your tool chest, right, in your treasure hunting kit, so you can basically put a black light on these pieces and recognize whether or not you have that. But not only Vaseline glass will fluoresce, so you want to be aware of that. Another myth. When it comes to myths, a lot of them have to do with the all ultra popular figurines. So one myth is all Hummels are the same, so they're not valuable. People think that every Hummel figurine is the same and they figure, ah, there's all so many of them, they're not valuable. This has been going around for literally decades. In 25 years in this field, I will tell you, I hear more at my events, more at my video call appraisals, more about Hummel figurines than a lot of other types of figurines. So this one is the one that I want you to think about too. So all Hummels are the same, so they're not valuable. Well, that's not the case. For example, the Merry Wanderer is a really popular um, Hummel figurine. So it has a mold number. Well, they mold them, right? So they're molded in the, in the factory, of course, in the porcelain factory. They're earthenware, actually earthenware ceramic that are hand painted. And they mold them in the factory. And then what happens is they get a mold number. So that number relates to all of them that are called the Merry Wanderer, okay? Or all of them that are called the Apple Tree Boy, or all of them that are called the Apple Tree Girl whichever ones that you want to, of course, deal with. But once they get out of that mold situation and they are hand painted, they're actually hand painted individually. So this is another situation, especially the older pieces. And they would be marked with a particular V and B or Goebel mark. Goebel is the manufacturer, of course, and Hummel was the designer. So a couple of different things. The painters who are painting these, you might have a Merry Wanderer figure and you might have, of course, the boy's shirt might be green or the boy's shirt might be another color 
or maybe you're going to have the apple tree boy or the apple tree girl and there's a little bird on one of the branches of the apple tree and the bird's wings in one of them uh, of the of the apple tree boy it might have you know a blue wing in another one it might have a red wing so there was a little bit of artistic license given to those who were hand painting the actual earthenware ceramic Hummel figurines so people will say they're all the same when in fact they're not all the same they could have nuances of differences throughout the figurine so that's a myth too that all the Hummel figurines are the same Hummel collectors know that they're not all the same and they know that they are in fact valuable based on many factors based on their design on their design based on which one they are which Hummel figurine it is um, you know Mary Wanderer or is it the Hummel tree uh, you know is it the um, apple tree girl or whatever it might be and they're also of course um, identified and valued based on of course their time period or their very all important marks which are usually the stamps on the underside of those figurines so don't be taken by that myth either the next myth is of course all Murano glasses marked you're all talking about marks you all care about marks I've seen literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of Murano and many of those pieces of course that are hand blown in the very famous long-standing factories glass factories of Murano near Venice are in fact marked in different ways are they all marked many of them are marked in different ways they are not all marked so this is the other issue that we have people will think this myth is true when it actually is false so here's what happens with Murano a lot of the Murano pieces that are mid-century modern that many of you are collecting and many of you are reselling and many of you are just enjoying even in museums are literally of course inscribed or they have a label put on them right and like an adhesive label um, and they have different labels at different times sometimes when they get to a thrift store a yard sale an estate sale that label has been lost so it may be a piece of Murano and you're thinking it's not a piece of Murano because of course you don't have a mark or you don't have an adhesive label so be aware of that also different designers who are working within the Murano or under the Murano umbrella within the Murano circle basically they'll have their own label or their own identifier as well their own mark if you will so when you say all Murano glass is marked well you could have a piece of Murano glass that no longer has its marked or was never marked so don't be taken in by that myth either be aware of that um, this next myth is one that I have to say I've talked about, I, I want to say I've talked about this for probably since my very early days in working in museums and I learned about this when I was at the Yale University Art Gallery as um, a museum staff person and I'll tell you this one everybody thinks is the other way around so this myth has been going a long long time. Uh, use bubble wrap to store your antiques. In fact bubble wrap is probably the worst thing to use for storage bubble wrap is in fact utilized and intended well it's a great new innovation it's a good thing bubble wrap is supposed to be used for transport right you're moving a piece from one place to another place and then you unwrap it and you put it in something else for storage long term you don't want to store your pieces in bubble wrap and the reason for it is a couple of them now a lot of you are using bubble wrap wrong too a lot of you are using bubble wrap in a way that isn't correct where you are not you're putting the bubbles up against the object the bubbles should not touch the object and I talk about how you should correctly of course use bubble wrap in one of my other videos but basically what we're looking at here with bubble wrap is this idea that bubble wrap in fact is used for transporting a piece or moving it from one place to another place so um, as I said you know you're it will trap dirt it will trap heat it will trap condensation and it will basically damage the piece so you want to make sure that you're not trapping heat with that bubble wrap around a particular object because if you trap the heat then that heat gets in there dirt gets in there and all of a sudden you've got the recipe to damage your piece or deteriorate the actual materials of your piece whether it's a ceramic whether it's a piece of bronze whether it's a plate whether it's an, uh, a work of art no matter what it is heat will do a lot of damage so you want to be careful of all of that that's important too but that's a big myth if people say use bubble wrap use bubble wrap to store your antiques it'll be good bubble wrap is not intended for that and you don't want to use it for that that's a big myth too this next myth 
is of course about Stife. The myth is all Stife stuffed toys have a metal button in their ear. Well, many of you recognize Stife toys and you know about the very famous metal button in the ear. It's on the teddy bears, it's on the other different stuffed toys, and you'll find it oftentimes. However, not all of them actually have that button. And that button is not in all of them. Why? Those pieces that were manufactured during World War II did not use the button because that metal button was not allowed to utilize that piece of metal, that little bit of metal, because of course during the war years, there were shortages of metal. So they couldn't use a metal just as an identifier, as like a logo tag. So they didn't use it then. The other thing that people forget about when they're looking at an antique toy like a Stife is, you know, kids were playing with them. You know, maybe a pet got a hold of the piece and took the, the metal ear tag out of it. You know, stuff gets deteriorated and oftentimes tags get pulled off almost immediately. You know, we see those with the newfangled swish mallows. You know, everyone says, hold the tag, hold the tag. And, you know, a kid gets it in his hand, he rips it right off. You know, that happens oftentimes. Or even Beanie Babies, we see that too. But for the Stife pieces, that myth is a long-standing one. All Stife stuffed toys have a button, a metal button in their ear. Well, that's a big myth too. Not all of them have it, and some of them are the authentic Stife pieces. So just because you don't see that button, you know, you want to make sure that you realize that you still could have a valuable piece of toy collectible, right? And then this next myth is toy train sets without a caboose have no value. You know, this always cracks me up, this whole thing about it has no value. It's like done, doomed, set, finished, you know, that's not how it works. So a couple of things, toy train sets, of course, to have the full set together is what you're looking for, including the caboose. You want as many, of course, you want the locomotive and as many trains as go in the particular set. If you can have the original box, like an original Lionel box, that's always good. But basically what you're looking at here, when they say the caboose is really the problem. If you don't have the caboose, the caboose is like the holy grail. Well, you know, having a full train set is really what you're looking for. Cabooses can be value on their own and the other trains, the other train cars and the locomotive without a caboose could still have value too. Yes, sets have the most value in this particular example, but it's not true that if you just don't have a caboose, you should throw all the other trains away. That's not the case either. You know, the, the caboose has its own mystique. You know, the caboose in toy trains, people like the caboose. It's usually colorful, oftentimes red, that kind of thing but it has its sort of own mystique in the tradition of train collecting. When it comes to collections, you have to remember that sets are very important. I've worked with one of the largest collections of, of course, toy trains in North America, and they were mainly sets. That's where the value comes from. But that doesn't mean if you had an individual caboose or an individual locomotive that those individual pieces didn't have value too. These are lies and myths. You wanna know these, and I'll help you know that information that you need. I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks for being with me. I'll see you next time.